Morning, church. How are you doing? <laughs> Hope you're having a great time so far. And we're going to continue with the, um, uh, with, with the um, Act series. Um, I don't know about you, but so every now and then I ask myself, why? You know, I mean, it's, uh, why there's only four Gospels? <laughs> why not eight? <laughs> why not ten? <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, and, and I think God gave me the answer already. You know, because he said, I mean, I, I'm giving you guys four Gospels. I think I, I, I mean, I, I, I said a lot already with the four Gospels. And that's why he said four Gospels, and then it's time to what? <laughs> to act. That's why we're going to go to the move of, I mean, to the book of Acts. Because God is saying, enough talking. Now it's time to act. Now it's time to do something with everything that you have learned from me on the cross and the resurrection. Amen? Amen? The Bible says, thank you. Appreciate it. As a matter of fact, let me take it out. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We're going to start reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 47. And the Bible says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And, and, and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were, caught, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were, were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They saw property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Amen. The title of my message this morning is Going Back to the Source. Going back to the beginning. Why do we always go back to the beginning? Why is it important to go back to the source? It's because sometimes we need to realign ourselves. <laughs> sometimes we need to renew ourselves and revitalize our belief system. <laughs> we have a set of rules, you know, we have a belief system that every, I mean, that every now and then needs some, some alignment. <laughs> That every now and then, I don't know if you see, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys follow Formula, I mean, Formula One. You know, they start racing, they start driving like crazy. But every now and then, they got to go back to, you know, I, don't, I mean, I don't even know how you call that. But they have to go back to change their wheels. <laughs> their pit stop. And we as disciples, we have to do the same thing. Because sometimes, you know, we get so caught up with life that we forget to go back just to check how we're doing spiritually, just to check what's going on with our life. And that's why I call this, uh, this, this sermon going back to the source. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to um, come and share the things that I've been learning so far, Father, from this, I mean, from, these, uh, uh, from Acts chapter 2. 
I pray more than anything that you take me out of, of, of I mean, of, of, of here and, let, and, and allow your word, Father, to make a difference in everyone that's going to be hearing it today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You see, Acts chapter 2, that's where everything began. If we want to go back, that's the chapter that talks about how the church in the first century started. The, here we see the birth of our Christian movement. And when we start reading about in, in chapter 2, we, I mean, we start seeing that at this moment Jesus was, I mean, Jesus died and he was resurrected. And for 40 days, he showed himself to more than 500 people, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16, verse 6, I'm sorry. He talks about that not only one, two, 10, 20, 50 people, I mean, uh, 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 he showed up to those, I mean, to, I mean, to only five, 50 or 60 people. No, 500 people. And he says that only, I mean, that 500 men show, I mean, uh, 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 she, uh, Jesus show himself to them. That makes me think, that's a lot of people. <laughs> After he, showed, after he presented himself to more, than five, to more than 500 people, before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem because something great was going to happen in Jerusalem. And 10 days after, they were able to receive the Holy Spirit. Man, thank you, bro. And after receiving the Holy Spirit, Peter was able to preach the most incredible sermon about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he says that more than 3,000 people that were there were able to listen to this message their heart was cut to, I mean, their heart were, I mean, was changed because of what they heard, and they became disciples. So they went all the way from 120 disciples to 3,120 in just one day. Sometimes I think about what were they thinking when they saw these people getting baptized? One after the other. Now they have 3,000 baby Christians in their congregation. 3,000 baby Christians that needed to be fed. 3,000 baby Christians that needed to change their diapers. <laughs> I did the numbers for you. And I divided 3,000 into 120. And he came up to 25 baby Christians per member. <laughs> so they were saying, Hassan, <laughs> you are responsible of 25 baby Christians. <laughs> you're going to take care of them. <laughs> they said, Barbara, you're going to have 25 members. And it's your responsibility to make sure <laughs> that they get to heaven that you train them, that you feed them, that you clean their you-know-what. <laughs> and I know that some of us don't like cleaning <laughs> or changing diapers. <laughs> but they had to be committed to help all these people, to understand the cross, to understand the reason why they had to follow Jesus. Another great thing that I see here is that how many of you have been disciples for more than 25 years? Raise your hands. 
wow, there's a lot of people here with 25 years, I mean, being a disciple. How many of you have been disciples for five years? Five years. More than two years. More than two years. More than two years as a disciple? Raise your hands if you've been a disciple for more than two years. <laughs> that means that the average disciple that was taking care for more than 25 baby Christians, they were only two years old <laughs> as a disciple. So they had to train themselves on how to lead, on how to help, on how to be more like Christ because they had tons of people that they had to take care of. <laughs> There wasn't any excuse for them. They had to make the decision to do whatever it needed to take to be the help that the church needed to be. Why did I um, 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 put the title Going Back to the Source? It's because we are the result of what happened 2,000 years ago. We are God's church. And every now and then, we got to see how they did it. How they were able to, uh, I mean, to take 120 ordinary people and do extraordinary things. How they were able to transform the world and keep on doing it up to today. And I see that they, that they focused themselves in four things. The first thing that, I, I mean, that they did was that um, um, they, um, they um, um, uh, the Bible says in, first, uh, in Acts 2, verse 37, I mean 42, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They understood that all these people, they needed teaching. They needed to help every single one of those 3,000 disciples. And even though if they, if they were two years old as a disciple or three years old, they needed to start being themselves involved in the, with the Bible. It wasn't, um, I mean, I couldn't picture them, I mean, these disciples just reading the Bible once a week. <laughs> Having quiet times for just 10 minutes. <laughs> Not dedicating themselves to read the Bible. Because they needed to have an answer to all those people that they needed to take care of. Sometimes I ask myself, how are we doing with reading our Bible? <laughs> are we a church that only reads the Bible when it has times? When I wake up early just one day out of the week? <laughs> or are we a church that's always digging? that is always reading the Bible, that is always, you know, I mean, memorizing scriptures. That is being a church, you know, that is known for knowing their Bible. <laughs> that is not just Googling the scriptures. <laughs> because I see myself doing that every now and then. Let me just, you know, I mean, um, um, just, go, just go to uh, 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 Mr. Google to start getting the answers. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I know that we were talking that um, um, how can you keep yourself alive or with the same zeal as years progress in your, in, in your, in your spiritual life? And I was telling him that that is really hard. <laughs> 
because what happened is that I don't know if you guys, I mean, some of you are, I mean, have been married for probably 10, 15 years. <laughs> but to have, you know, a, I mean, a relationship that is f- fresh for a long time, <laughs> it takes effort. <laughs> it takes dedication. <laughs> it takes, you know, you doing whatever you need to do to make sure that, you know, your relationship doesn't grow old. And here we see that... Um, as disciples, we got to be careful that we don't have the mentality of thinking that we know it all already. That we don't need to be reading our Bible more consistent. <laughs> I know that for me, what I've the way I've read my Bible five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago cannot be the same way that I read my Bible today. <laughs> that I need to dedicate more time to read my Bible. That I need to start digging, searching, <laughs> feeling in love with the Bible. I mean, uh, when I read about Paul, he's saying in, in the book of Philippians, I want to know Christ. And the power of his resurrection. He's saying this 35 years after he became a disciple. He felt that he did not know everything. He was still having this kindergarten mentality about the Bible. And I see that this is the same thing that I see in these disciples. They were saying that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And when I think about the apostles' teachings, about, I think about these scriptures for our life. In First Th- uh, uh, Timothy 4.16, it says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save yourself in your hearers. You see, life and doctrine needs to go hand by hand. That same uh, scripture, but in, in, in another verse, it says, keep a firm grasp of, on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep, just keep at it. Both you and those who hear, who hear you will experience salvation. Titus 2, 7, 8 talks about in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Then, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, it says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 20, it says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appear through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Basically, what he's saying is, we cannot be one thing here and be something else out there. If we are claiming to be disciples, we got to let the world know that what they see here at church is the same thing that they're going to see if they see us alone in the world. Why am I saying this? It's because it's easy to read what the Bible says And when we are under pressure, forget what the Bible says. Why am I saying this? Because sometimes we forget that we are Christ's ambassadors. And when I think about an ambassador, I think of someone that is representing his country. Someone that when they see it, they say, wow, if, if, if that's the way that 
that, I mean, that this, I mean, if, if this ambassador is behaving this way, I want to be part of this country. <laughs> Being an ambassador means that you are taking the load, you're taking the burden of showing, you know, wherever you go, that you are, that you are representing the values, that you are representing, you know, I mean, like everything that your country represents. And that's what God is telling us. We, as disciples, are ambassadors to the world. That we need to set the example that we need to be different, that we need to show everyone out there that being a disciple is the best thing and that we don't compromise our values and our convictions. Why? Because what we are is because Jesus died for us. Then the other thing that he, um, I mean, that they focus with the church was on fellowship. When I was looking at that word in Greek, that word means koinonia. The word koinonia, what it means is to share. It means community. It means joint participation. It means joint contributing. That we are on the same page. That we are heading in the same direction. That we are working together towards a, co a, a common goal. That means that if I look at Helen, or if I look at Destiny, or at Ryan, that means that we have the same conviction, the same dedication. That we don't practice here the 2080 formula. I don't know if you know about that one. <laughs> that only 20% of the group is doing the 80% of the work. <laughs> but that everyone is involved. That everyone is doing what's supposed to be doing. Because we have a common purpose. And it's to present Christ as the example. You see... When I said previously that when you divided the 3,000 into 120 and 25 of them, you know, I mean, every single one of the disciples was supposed to be responsible for 25. Imagine if that disciple said, you know what? Forget about it. <laughs> I got no time for this. Whenever I get a free time, I'm going to dedicate myself to these 25 people. I cannot think of one of these disciples of just showing <laughs> once a month to, to take care of his people. <laughs> or not being there present. Or being on social media. <laughs> or not being involved. Something that I've realized is that fellowship means that we got to be present. We got to be together. We got to see each other. See, fellowship means that, I, was, I mean, I, I was looking for that word specifically. It says a person in the, same I mean, the same position, involved in the same activity, or otherwise associated with another. I also look at what the scripture says. It says, they devoted themselves. He also says, everyone was filled with awe. He says, all the believers worked together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to everyone who had need. And then, and then he says, every day, they continued to meet together. <laughs> In the temple court. Being in a, in a fellowship is not the same as being a member. <laughs> Membership and fellowship are two different things. We got to ask yourself, are we a member of a church 
or do we have a fellowship of a church? <laughs> because being a member, you just clock in. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to you. We just clock in. Okay, I'm here today. I don't even know where I'm coming, where I'm coming back. Or whenever I get some free time, then I come back. No. Being in the fellowship means that we are involved, that we are in this together, that we're working for the common good. And what is the common good? To go and preach the word to every living person in the Lehigh Valley. Amen? <laughs> That's what God is calling us to do. You know, to all be, be involved. And then what happened? Because everyone decided to do that, great things, well, great things happen. I was reading an article the other day about the de-churching. I don't know if you know what's going on you know, in, in, in America. <laughs> Every year, more than 4,500 churches are closing in the United States. Every year, 4,500. The average church in the United States is 120 members. In the past 25 years, 40 million Americans decided to leave the church. 40 million Americans decided that they won't believe. And you would think that the reason why they're leaving church is because of the bad examples in the church, which, of course, that thing is affecting as well, too. But the majority of the people that decided to leave church is because they no longer had that fellowship mentality. They no longer wanted to meet together. They were not involved. They were just giving some of their time, some of their money, some of their dedications. I give when I can because I got other things, you know, that are more, um, um, that requires my attention. And nothing about the church is about being or having an individual mentality. Everything that we read in the scriptures, it talks about they. They were together. <laughs> they, they met together. They ate together. <laughs> you know, they share a common purpose. You see, having a fellowship is intentional. We cannot just leave it to um, when it happens. We got to make a decision. Because the only way we're going to change the world, the only change we're going to, I mean, um, 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 put the world upside down is if we understand that we are the body of Christ. That's the only way we're going to make some big changes, just like, the, just like the first century disciples did. Another great thing that I've seen, and I've seen it in this church, is that this church, we know how to love people. <laughs> I know that when I first moved in uh, from the Dominican Republic, Man, you guys took care of me, man. <laughs> and I'm always going to be thankful to Barbara and Dennis for the way they, you guys, you know I mean, you guys pour your heart to this church. And to wrap it up, verse 42 talks about, he says that, hold on, let me get there. This is life, okay? <laughs> It says in verse 42, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They didn't have to do anything. All they had to do was <laughs> read their Bible, <laughs> be an example, and be involved. Understand that this was not a fellow, I mean that this was not a membership. This was a fellowship. 
And once they put that into practice, great things happened. Great things happened. He says that the Lord, besides the 3,120, the Lord keep, I mean, kept on adding to their numbers those who were being saved. If you are struggling finding a Bible study, <laughs> this is what you have to do. <laughs> because the Lord, he's going to do it for you. <laughs> Just open your mouth, share your faith, and God is going to put them there. <laughs> Amen? God bless you.